And, uh, you know, you mentioned being in the gutter that I was saying, like, you can be in a gutter if you're a homeless man on the street, or you can be in a gutter in a $500,000 tour bus on the road in a rock band. It depends on the condition of your heart and where you're at inside. It doesn't matter. And my gutter moment was everything. I felt like a gutter inside. It was just gross and worms and stinky and dirty. And that's what I felt like. And I just, I was trying to forget it. And I got worse and worse and worse into the drugs until, you know, it was so dark that I wanted to kill myself, but I didn't have the, I just didn't have what it took to do it. So I would just, I would do so many drugs thinking, wishing I would die and just fall asleep. Cause I thought by that time, I had just thought like, well, I'll probably just, um, you know, I'll fall asleep and I'll never wake up and that's it. You're just, you're dead, you're asleep. So that's what I thought back, that's what I believed back then, but you know, I couldn't get out. So, I mean, this is a, this is a pretty desperate situation. Even as I read your story, I mean, my heart is just being twisted in two. What, what was the turning point for, for you when you were like, here's all the gutter stuff in my past, I'm turning my back on that, and I'm walking, taking my life in a whole different direction. What was your turning point? You know it. Yeah, I do know it. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was crazy. It was like I was in a train wreck, or I was in a train heading towards a, a, a just a big train wreck, and it's like somebody just stopped the train right at the last second. And so I just felt like, I felt like a complete failure. I was like the biggest internet troll, druggy, porno freak. I had a beautiful little angel daughter, but I was just mess, methamphetamines every day. I took them all over the world because I was such an addict. When I ran out overseas, I had my dealer ship them to me overseas. I could have went to jail. I could have, I could have been put to death in other countries for having drugs. I was risking everything. And uh, so, at the end of that two-year drug binge on methamphetamine, I was like, I gotta get sober for my daughter, because I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be any good for her. I have to get sober. And so I tried to get sober on my own. It didn't work as a last resort. Because I always thought Christians were like the Ned Flanders on Simpsons, you know? <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. That's the picture, you know, 15 years ago, what I thought a lot of people did. Like, oh, they, you know. So I was like, but this guy where I lived, it was back in Bakersfield where it all started where that first ACDC album came to my ears. I moved back then. I moved back there then, by then, and uh, a friend of mine I was actually doing business with, he invited me to go to church. I was like, well, this guy doesn't act like Ed, Ned Flanders. Maybe I'll just go with him and see what happens. <laughs> I was like, I can't get sober on my own, so let's try it. I go to church. The guy is just, he's, the pastor's up there. His eyes are just like burning with something that is so real to him mm. and he was so convinced that Jesus was real and I was just like going wow that guy really believes this fairy tale <laughs> you know and he's, he's just saying Jesus is so real I was an alcoholic I abused my wife Jesus came in and he set me free he gave me a new life he put my marriage back together I, I started this church with five people and it was like almost 10,000 members oh and, and I was like Either this guy has the answer for life, or he's a cult leader and he's taking everyone's money. That's what I was thinking, <laughs> right? So I was like, all right, I don't trust him yet, but my, my heart's pounding and I feel this peace inside the church. And I just, he says, anybody want to receive Jesus? And I was like, you know, everyone's heads bowed. I, just, I raised my hand. In my head, I'm going, I need this. I go, oh God, if God's real, if this is real, then this is going to be the best thing that's ever happening. Happening to me. But if he's real, oh gosh, he saw everything that I did. <laughs> and I started feeling the weight of my guilt of all the stuff violating my conscience over and over. And so I prayed the prayer that, you know, I raised my hand, prayed the prayer, and I was I was on speed when I was at church, because I did speed every day. And the first thing in my head was like, okay, I prayed the prayer, now I gotta go home and pray to Jesus and get out of get out of this place. Cause I was tweaked out. I was like, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> No, I'm just being honest. So after I went to church, 
watch what Jesus does. I went I went home after church and I, I had my drugs laid out in my closet. My daughter was watching Disney Channel. And I, just like the video said, I snorted the line and I, and I just, I remember the pastor saying, bring your garbage to Jesus in prayer. Like bring it all to him. He's not... All those, all the drugs are, all the pornography, all that stuff, they're symptoms of something wrong inside. That's just the symptoms. He's not afraid or, or offended by it. He just wants you to come to him so he can demolish everything that is ruining your life. And that's what I did. I came to him and I said, and I said, Jesus, take this from me or I'm, I'm a dead man. My daughter deserves a better father. I just, I prayed for like, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I was like, <laughs> I just let my heart spill out into wow. prayer. And, you know, long story short, within a couple weeks, you know, I was going to church off and on. I was doing drugs off and on, but I had an encounter with God's love that totally like lifted me out of this earth realm that we feel every day. It was like a love that was so forgiving, unconditional, a peace that was just, it felt angelic. It felt from, it felt like it was from, like a hand came from eternity and just put it on my heart and started healing me inside. Wow. It was so real. I threw away the drugs. I stopped doing drugs. I stopped drinking. I haven't done any drugs drinking since that day. And uh, yeah. telling you right now, it was like, I traveled this whole world, I crawled the whole world, like touring, doing everything, like the best of the best, hotels, all that, and I bought my homes that I live in, nice houses, awesome backyards, I, I never felt, I felt like a fish out of water, and when God came into my heart that day, and took all the drugs from me, and gave me this relationship with Him, I felt like I was home for the very first time in my life, Wow! and I've been home ever since, you know? It's such a beautiful feeling. So, now, um, um, those moments, I mean, talking to your book too is kind of convicting for you, maybe really convicting hearing your daughter sing one of your corn songs that are kind of bug chatting. Um, but now, from that point forward, it, uh, it would seem like your relationship with your daughter as well would be transformed um nowadays yeah yeah um i'm i'm so transparent with my life and everything and yeah i raised her in in that um with with christ and everything for eight years and uh and you know her mom was out of her life all those years and she was she was doing really good but a couple years ago my daughter fell into the, the, the worst depressions and I took her on the road she was actually selling merch for me and my Christian project and everything but she just she wasn't connecting with friends we had moved to Nashville and she fell into this depression and uh, she got in some bad relationships online and everything and and I caught that and and she started getting suicidal and she started cutting like really bad I took her to um, counselor and we said that you know my counselor uh, mentioned a, a nuclear button to where if she didn't get better then we're gonna have to push a nuclear button so now we have to push it and now she, for almost two years she has been in a boarding school and she is thriving awesome. and she she used to hate god a couple years ago she was like i don't want your god i don't want another and uh we were just butt heads big time it's like the teenage horns came out <laughs> but it was more than that. It was her. It was a symptom, right? It was a symptom of something deeper. So she loves God now. She's like on track. She sees her future is bright, and she knows she's called for something awesome. And so she, everything's great right now. It how really old, is. How old is she now? Sixteen. Sixteen. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. She'll be. Yeah, she's turned sixteen. So. You know, I, I think probably. Everybody in this room that's either been a teenager or has been a parent can connect. Um, my oldest son, Josh, um, was clinically depressed when he was a teenager and um, did the Christian counseling thing, um, uh, was on medication for about six months, really got undepressed just, just from that, hasn't been depressed since. He's 36 now, plays in our band, is going to get married in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um,
But I, but you know, it's a time when you're going through it with your kids. Yeah, marriage is good. Marriage is good. <laughs> um, you know, you just feel like your world, like you, you don't. I mean, I felt like as a dad, I didn't have a clue. All I could do was pray, cry out to God. God was faithful. I mean, I'm so proud of my son. He's like one of my best friends now. But I, you know, then get to see your children when they're on the other side. Um, I, I just pray over my kids, you know, God, if you'll just help them find your love. Cover them with your loving kindness. And I, I'm happy for you. Though... Um, if you would with me right now, would you, I, I read your daughter's name in the book, but I'm not sure I can pronounce it right. How do you pronounce your daughter's name? Gary. No way. <laughs> That's my favorite name in the whole world, <laughs> Gary. That name follows me everywhere I go. Um, her name's Jenea. Jenea. Yeah. Um, Usually people say Jenea, but yeah. just throw the uh at the end. Jenea. Would you guys mind praying with me for Jenea right now? Um... Father, we're, again, we're so grateful that Brian is here. And um, we're just asking that you cover his daughter with your loving kindness. Whatever she's doing in India right now, wherever she is, she just, her heart skips a beat involuntarily. She just says, thank God. And she just becomes overwhelmed with a sense of your presence. And this work that you've begun in her, Father, that you've rescued her, you've delivered her, we ask that you bring this, this work to its completion, its fulfillment, its perfection. And we know it's still tough being a teenager. She's 16 years old. We ask your loving kindness on this girl, um, particularly as Brian is out sharing his faith. You share your goodness with her. We know that she has angels before your face night and day, Lord. Would you deploy them right now by this prayer of faith yes. to meet her every need emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm grateful to you that you're willing to do that. Um, so, how many years has it been since you've been a Christ follower? Oh, I've got to ask you to tell me, answer that question, and I'll ask you my next one. How, how many years have you been a Christ follower now? Um, nine, I think. Wait. Nine. Nine years? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe ten in January, I forget. Oh, cool. Well, I, I know the other thing, you had a unique baptism experience. Uh, you had the privilege of being baptized in the Jordan River in... Israel, what was what was that like? It was the most like, wow. I mean, I had been a Christian for like a month or two, and so I was coming off the drugs and everything, and but I was so lit up for God, like I was all in, hundred percent all in. But I just didn't know the Bible yet, you know. And so we were going to all these places, and I read like in the Bible, oh my gosh, Jesus was baptized. He was baptized there. I'm like, I want to go in there. You know, it was so cold. It was like 50 yes. degrees. <laughs> and, uh, it was in February, so I don't know what the season was over there, but like it was cold. That's all I know. And it was just, it was beautiful. I, I felt like, I felt like I was just being carried by a hand of glory like the whole time in Israel. Almost mm. the whole time. I just wow. felt this like deep, deep, rich, like, a piece that was like almost tickled inside. It felt so good. You know, some, I love those times. God will make you feel so good that, you know, it just feels like it's, it's from another realm. And so I felt that in Israel, you know, but I came back to a bunch of hell. So, you know, but it's always up and down in this life because we're not in heaven yet, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, how about not too long after you became a Christ follower, you went to India and... As you were describing those feelings in Israel, I know the times when I've gone, like to Ecuador or Haiti, I have a couple of adopted children from uh, Haiti, that I felt that way, I mean, the same way I do in Israel, I felt that way on the mission field. And I know that your heart went over there and you started an orphanage, or you paid for an orphanage. Yeah, or? yeah. Um, you say Haiti? Yeah, my kids. Oh, cool, I'm going to Haiti in January. Oh, you are? Wow, yeah. awesome. I haven't been on a mission trip or since... Oh, a long time. I think 05. So, yeah, I did that in India. Um, I just met a guy, and I was so wild for the faith. I was like, I saw the Bible people there, like, they left jobs and just followed Jesus everywhere. So I was like walking, I was like looking for something just to do wild, you know? And so I met this guy, he's like, yeah, I'm going to India in, in two months. And I was like, I'm going with you. <laughs> and I went with him. And I put like a bunch of money 
towards a, a orphanage, and, a, and they said, okay, you put that much money, we'll, we'll name it after whatever you want. And I just called it the Head Home because my nickname's Head. Got a big old head, and uh, <laughs> so yeah, I called it the Head Home. And um, so I was involved in that for a little bit, but then that that guy I went with, actually me and him parted ways, and there was some uh, a little bit of shady things going on. Mm -hmm. So so I parted ways with that. But yeah, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. It so, was interesting to be in India, though. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I could relate. I said I read that in your book. But what about Haiti? Why are you going down there? Um, it happened again. I met this guy the other day. <laughs> I don't do this. But he was like, he mentioned Haiti, and I was like, really? And he said just awesome things happen. Like, you know, a lot of miracles, like, you don't see in front of our faces in America. You do sometimes, but over in other countries, you'll see crazy things happen. Like, miracles, like, it'll just make you go back home, scratching your head and everything, going, how did that happen? Like, you know, Jesus like made blind people see, and all that stuff still happens in the in the place where there's no doctors. Right on. Yeah. And the God needs to heal because they don't have any other option. So he just said that he mentioned Haiti, and then actually, as I was saying, I want to like I want to go. He was saying, I think you're supposed to go with me. And this guy's a real credible guy, and so so yeah, I'm going. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's only six days, you know. Yeah, that could be a long time in Haiti. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My, no, wife, just <laughs> my, my Debbie lived down there for nine months while we were trying to get our son, who now is 23 and married, and wow. his wife's having a baby any moment. He's a Haitian? Yeah, my son, wow. 23. That's um, rad. Yeah, he came, uh, I think, 11 years ago to America. Um, but it was really hard getting him out of Haiti. I mean, hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. You know, you think in America, if we fill out the forms, we pay our money, yeah. we get whatever we want. And um, so she, his life was in danger. In his village, he was like the poorest of the poor. His mother had been a uh, prostitute. And not like we think of in America, but the kind of mom who can't feed her kids, so she sells her body to men to get rice and beans for her children. And one of her men murdered her. And it's one of the situations in Haiti as it is in lots of countries. The person who got her pregnant with my son, that man, he was never in the, in the picture. So my son was an orphan just running the streets. And he was in, in his village and he was, as a result, he was the lowest of the low. You don't have a mom, you don't have a dad, you don't have family, you don't have nothing. And so when they found out that someone was adopting him, uh, the voodoo Satan worship religion was after him. So my wife would go down and live there and take care of him for three months, come back to the States. Wow. Yeah, for a month, go back for three months, come back to the States for a month, go back down for three months. And, and God is faithful, you know. And I, I was teasing about Haiti. It had been a long time in Haiti. I'm sure that God will speak to you and that He will use you. And I know He's using you. I, I feel like He's using you now with corn. That I mean, maybe it's a question some of these guys have who are Christ followers. You left corn, you're back with corn. What drove that decision for you to be back with the band? The Holy Spirit. That's a good thing. You know, it's, yeah, it's a funny thing. You got to be careful. There's a, there's Jesus said, you know, why does the road that leads to destruction and many follow it, but narrow is a road that leads to life. There's a middle road, and it's. And it's narrow. It's a narrow road. On this side of that road, you can fall into religion and be like the Pharisees, who Jesus had a real problem with. And the other side, there's like the obviously the the, the evil, you know, the, the whatever, the drugs, the the stealing, the murder, all this stuff. But that narrow road is life. And and you know, I just I found out that that I was falling kind of maybe in. To maybe the more religious side, mm. not not like being mean, judgmental to people, but like thinking, like how could God do that? Because it was eight years, you know. And for me, away from corn, I was like, you know, I would have to hear some miracle, like the, all the bands like totally turned their, around, and they're not going to totally change their style, but things are going to be different. But that didn't happen. Then he led me back. I ended up at a corn concert, and I just I'm sitting here watching metal bands all day. Corn was playing, it was a festival, there was like countless bands. And I'm sitting there like feeling emotional, getting choked up while looking at the crowd at a metal concert. 
And I'm going, this has got to be God. And I just felt like he was saying, like, these are my people. There's a sea of people. And he was just saying, these are my people. Mm. And wow. I just felt like he was saying, like, you know, I didn't, I didn't clean you up and do all this, you know, just for you. I want them. Wow. You know, and, and uh, I didn't know what it meant. But I got a phone call to play on their next record after, awesome. after that. I, I turned it down right away because I just, I don't know. I, it had been that long. I felt like, well, God, if you're going to do it, why, did, why would you do it four years after I left? It's been almost a decade, you know? It was like I went, I, I walked down this road so far. It was like, why would you pull me back? But, so I had to get it through my head. And then he kept nudging me. And then I, I started talking to people. And they found out the pastor that brought me into you know, that church in Bakersfield that I told you I got saved at, he had been praying for years that I'd go back. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I called him, I was like, what do you think? He's like, yes, I've been praying for this year. I'm like, what? Put Pastor Ron on the phone. No. Who is this? So, uh, you know, I just, I totally went back there and I didn't know what it was going to look like. There's another Christian guy in the band. The lyrics are still like F and F and F and, you know, a lot. Not all the time. But, you know, so a lot of the songs are, he's just, that's how he talks. It's the culture. It's just every other word is that. So, you know, and, and Jesus is not offended by anything. I'm telling you. He just wants people. You think, like, when we get to heaven, they're going to be, like, Jesus is going to be, like, you know, they're going to be a religious person. Be like, Jesus, how could you, how, how come he went back into that band? You didn't, you didn't lead him back there, did you? Did you hear what they were singing? And he's going to go. Look at all these people, and there's going to be countless souls there, you know. And so, I really think that's going to happen. And um, I just, I'm really finding out how really not uptight God is. He's just so like, he's the most freest person in the whole universe. He's so free; nothing like gets him under his skin. He's, you know, I'm not participating in nothing. I'm, I'm there for a purpose. I'm focused. And you know, we were talking about that movie Holy Ghost that yeah. just came out. Um, we're, we're making a point. To talk to people, and we're not even trying. Actually, people are coming to us, going, you know, I, I've been, I saw your video online. I want to talk to you. I'm like, okay, he's getting saved today. Another guy. <laughs> another guy. Another guy like, hey, you know what? I found the biggest trick, you guys. Ask God every morning to say, God, reveal my my reveal people's heart to me. Reveal, because when the, when you start talking to people, they'll say something. And you'll be like, they're getting saved today. Or really soon. Because they'll say something. Because God will reveal their heart. And you'll know it in your spiritual ears. That, like he's, he's drawing your attention to something. And it may take a few months, you know, or whatever. But, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's, he's on the move and it's exciting. Yeah, here's the coolest thing I think about it, Brian. I, um, that other Christ followers in this room work in a factory or in an office or in a school. And so it's not a Christian environment. And they're Christ followers working in that environment. But here you guys are going out at one time before and after the concert. I guess now after the concert, meeting with the fans and praying with them. I know in the, sh in the show that it indicated that you would ask if anybody's an atheist and you'd go pray with them. So, you know, I think it, that God is using you, obviously. And it would be, it would, it's a great example to all of us. Who may not, maybe don't work in Christian environments, but we can be a reflection of the light of Christ wherever we are. Yeah, exactly. Everywhere. I'm not more special than anybody, obviously. Look at me. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's just God, it just wants people. Man, he's showing up. He's doing, it's an exciting time to be alive, you guys. I remember back in the 80s and stuff, I used to see the Christian stuff on TV. Oh, man, I don't know if I would have been able to deal with that. God, it, God is really <laughs> opening up. Like, just who he is as a person, his heart for this generation like no other. So, yeah, just try to get involved with it. Just ask him to be involved in, and just wherever you're at, you know, God will reveal stuff to people. And, uh, man, he's so good. He is good. And, and he is in you. And, I again, I'm so grateful that you'd be willing to come with us, tell your story uh, to our community, and um, let the Christ life uh, shine through you. Um, I would like to do a couple things. Uh, one, I, I wanted to say to you guys, um, I, I know in, in our community and in this room right now, there's a bunch of you who are struggling uh, 
with addiction. Pornography, drugs, alcohol, over shopping, over eating, over caring about the Packers. Um, <laughs> no, I'm messing with you a little bit, but here, here's the deal. Every Friday night, right here, we have our Breaking Free ministry for folks that are finding Jesus in recovery. And uh, you can get help, you can get hope, you can find healing. <clears throat> um, also, I believe out there, um, Team Challenge is here tonight. And uh, it's a... Yeah, I love yeah, Team yeah, Challenge. Right on, you girls here from Team Challenge? Awesome, we love you. Thank you very much. And so they can come talk to you. Ladies, you'll, you'll be hanging around out there and they can talk to you. The other thing I want, I want to be clear about tonight, um, I, I have the honor of sitting up here with this man. And freak, I, I thought you were going to say freak, freak <laughs> show. <laughs> with this freak show. No. I thank God for you, my friend, and I'm, I'm grateful, very grateful. You'll get sick of me saying it. Honored to have you here. I want to say also... Uh, great greetings to our satellite campus in Janesville. That you guys had a chance to um, be a part of, of Brian being here and hearing his story. But I just want to be clear. In case you know you came into church for the very, very first time. Maybe like when Brian went um, because his partner invited him. Bakersfield, nine, ten years ago. I want, I want you to know what the, what the good news is. It's very, very simple. Out of His outrageous love for you, God sent His Son, Jesus, to die for you. Jesus died for all your stuff, for all your sin, for all your mess. Died for mine. In fact, here in our church, we like to say it this way. I'm a mess. You're a mess. We're all a mess. We're just trying to get our messes closer to Jesus. He died for your sins. He was fully, physically dead when they killed Him on the cross. They buried him on the third day, according to the scriptures. He was raised by the power of God from the dead. And that's where we get this victory power. Uh, go ahead, I Since you want to say something. Oh, just when you're saying that, I just, I picture Jesus. He's like, he turns the most ugly, ugly, ugly situations and ugly things in us and makes just pure, beautiful, like, transformation. It's like, it's like we are, are it's like I was a, a, a porno freak on the internet and the, on the worst sites and everything. And it was like Jesus came to me and said, I love you. Give me a diamond or something. You know, it's just like, no, no, I love you. You're not, that's not you. You don't know your identity yet. Your identity is in me. Yeah. And you're going to change. And just like every time you mess up, he gives you a gift. If, as long as you keep trying and want to change and he starts to change you by that. Um, it's it's not love like earth. It's like it's like you mess up. He gives gifts and he and he teaches you and he bring he picks you up and he dusts you off and it's just crazy. It's so wild, man. It's so awesome. It is thinking awesome. It is, yeah. right? I tell you what, you guys. I am as a pastor here. I am just flat out honored to have Ryan with us and grateful. He's got a really crazy busy schedule uh, and that he. Will come here to be with us is huge to me. So, um, we're going to pray. And um, I'm going to ask you to pray with me for him. Okay? Father, um, you, are, you are a great and awesome God. And I call your continued goodness uh, down on my new friend Brian. I thank you that you have rescued, delivered, and saved him. And tonight I know that sometimes he's telling his story. It, somebody's getting wrecked. Somebody's experiencing Jesus for the very first time. Somebody's getting some hope. And I just pray, Lord, that you continue to use him, that you protect him, that you put a, a, a favored, rich blessing on he and his relationship with his daughter. Continue to let him bring you the glory, Father. And I just pray your protection, your provision in his life. In the name of Jesus, we pray for Brian. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes.